elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to the Society in the State podcast. Uh, Connor is taking this podcast off today, but uh, I'm very, very happy to get to connect with someone who I have found interesting actually for years. His name is John Perkins. He's the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And John, um, that is only a partial description of the incredible journey you have had in life. But I have to begin with the question, economic hitman, you've got my attention. What exactly does that mean? Well, I think, Brian, it's fair to say that economic hitmen have created uh, basically a failed economic system, uh, what I call a death economy that's based on uh, militarization and uh, consuming ourselves into extinction, basically destroying, ravaging resources, killing the earth, basically killing what it is that our economy depends on. And the way we, <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't intentional that way, but the way we did this back in the 70s when I was an economic hitman, and this con- has continued through to today, is what we would do is identify countries with resources that corporations want, like oil, arrange huge loans to those countries from the World Bank and its sister organizations, and yet the money would never actually go to the countries. It would go to our own corporations, the Halliburtons and Bechtels and Stone Websters, et cetera, to build big infrastructure projects in those countries, power plants, industrial parks, highways, things that, of course, benefited those companies. They made huge profits and also benefited a few wealthy families, the ones that owned the the industries, the commercial establishments, the banks. And therefore, it showed that the gross domestic product was increasing, that you had economic growth, because the statistics are very, very skewed to those wealthy people who really control the economy. The majority of the people in these countries would suffer because money was diverted from health care and education and other social services to try to pay off the interest on the loans. And in the end, the principal could never be bought down. So we'd go back and say, hey, can't pay your debts? Sell your resource, oil, whatever, real cheap to our to our corporations without wow. environmental wow. social restrictions. So essentially, those who were making the loans couldn't lose. Right, right. The money all came back to our corporations. That was That's, the, that's how the World Bank works, actually. It's and, and, and incidentally, in the, in the instances where leaders would not accept these terrible conditions, <laughs> it would hurt their people ultimately, although many of them would benefit because they own the industries. Some of those leaders, that would, the ones who, who refused to accept these, would be visited by people we call the jackals, uh, CIA assets usually, who either overthrew governments or assassinated their leaders. And I talk about two of my clients, the president of Ecuador and head of state of Panama, who were both assassinated because they refused to play this game. So, John, walk us through the process. Uh, How were you recruited into being an economic hitman? What was your background prior to being approached by the U.S. government? Well, I I graduated from business school, uh, and um, I actually was trying to avoid the draft in Vietnam. Uh, And uh, my, my wife's father was a very good friend of the then, one of the men at the very top of the National Security Agency, which was a draft deferrable position at the time. So he uh, recruited me and put me through a series of lie detector and other tests, which I passed. But then I was drawn to go into the Peace Corps. I've always been interested in going to the Amazon, and, and he encouraged me to do this, in fact, helped me get in there. So I spent the next three years in Ecuador, in the Amazon and the Andes of Ecuador, and learning other languages and how to survive and uh, under difficult conditions, et cetera. And, and he had said, you know, you'll be even more valuable to us when you come out. And so when I came out, I was recruited by this consulting firm uh, in Boston, uh, which was which did a lot of this kind of work. And I was recruited as an economist. I had you know, graduated, as I said, from business school. And now I had this other experience in Ecuador I very quickly rose to chief economist. Uh, I, I created a department that grew very rapidly. I, I and very soon had about 50 people working for me. All of us engaged in, in, the, in, the, in the very business that I just described for you. So is this a part of foreign policy that uh, most Americans wouldn't be aware of? I mean, we hear about every military um, you know, action, every military strike or deployment, 
but the economic side doesn't really seem to be portrayed in the evening news. No, we, we, and, and if we do hear about it, we hear the opposite. We hear about all the great things we're doing for these countries, the loans we're giving them. People have often said, well, why do these countries dislike us so much? We're giving them all this money. Well, the fact of the matter is we're not giving them the money. The money's coming back to us, and a few of their wealthy people are getting much wealthier. Uh, often those are uh, brutal dictators, and many of the people I dealt with, uh, such as in Ecuador and in Guatemala and Argentina and many other countries, Indonesia, uh, Iran, uh, were dictators who had been put into power in many cases by the CIA and kept there by the CIA. They were, they were our puppets. And so uh, we, we hear in the United States about how our foreign aid and all this money we loan to countries is such a great thing for those countries. Well, it, it can be if you, you know, highways and industrial parks and, and improved economic conditions can help in the long run. But it's, but that's not how it's done. It's, it's done to really further our interests, and it's done a great job. We, we actually created a, a, a global empire. It's really a corporate empire, not an American empire, because these corporations, a lot of them relocate to other places like Dubai, et cetera. But it's a, it's a global empire uh, that's based on this, this system of, of debt and also fear. There's a lot of fear involved in this, that if you don't do it this way, you, the communists are going to get you, the Chinese are going to come in, the Russians are going to come in, somebody's going to come in. So it's a very, very effective system that's actually also quite secret or we're misled about its true impacts. Well, and, and you've, you've actually partially answered the next question that I wanted to ask you, which was, who has more influence in global affairs, governments or corporations? Corporations, no question about it. Today, corporations really pretty much run the world. Um, you know, no, nobody gets elected in the United States to a high position without a lot of corporate support. We certainly saw that with Obama. Uh, and, and in the end, he, he brought, uh, you know, the people from Wall Street, Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street firms in to basically run his administration, especially the financial side of it. And, and we're certainly seeing that extremely strongly now with Trump. And I mean, and, and Trump is a it's, it's very obvious because Trump himself is so deeply involved in big business around the world. But it's not a Republican affair. It's 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 part of our system. Corporations really call the shots. And that's true in, in Russia. I just came from Russia, incidentally. And in Kazakhstan, I just came from there. Just It's true in China, where I've spent time. And, and it's, it's true all over the world that these big corporations have tremendous influence. So is this one of the reasons why, um, even when the elections are held, the names and faces may occasionally change, but the direction, the overall direction of the country really doesn't change? That, that elite policy always seems to come through in the end. Absolutely. Yes, no matter what an Obama or a Bush or a Trump says when they go to get elected, once they're in office, they find that they're very, their power is, is very, very limited. Uh, and it's very much controlled by big corporations. Their power is, o is, not, is only not limited if they fall in line with the big corporations. And in a way, the Bushes represented that pretty strongly, that, that many of their belief systems were very much in, in line with corporations. In fact, of course, they came out of a very strong corporate background in the oil companies. So, John, um, when you had access to um, different heads of state or to the leaders of various countries, uh, you mentioned that there were a few who were incorruptible or who would not take the deal. Was that relatively rare? Were most politicians flexible, you know, morally? They, they could be twisted and turned? Yes, they, it's very rare. Uh, you know, the two I mentioned, Jaime Roldos, democratically elected president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos uh, of Panama, were, were, were the exception. And they were very aware that Salvador Allende had been taken out in Chile because he stood up to big corporate interests, American corporate interests there. Uh, Arbenz of Guatemala had been taken out because he stood up to uh, <laughs> what's now Dole and Chiquita. They had different names then. Uh, and Mossadegh in Iran was taken out because he stood up against oil companies in Lebanon of the Congo and Diem of Vietnam. You can go on and on. The list is extensive. And when one of these pre presidents or head of state is, 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 has enough integrity to stand up to the system, like Roldos and, and Torrijos, and they're then assassinated, this sends a message. 
across the world that that nobody else should do this. It recently happened with the president of Honduras, the lie of not been about five years when he was taken out in a CIA coup because he opposed a Chiquita and a Dole, uh, same companies that were opposed by Arbenz back in Guatemala before. And that sent a very, very strong message throughout Latin America and the world. Uh, and, and, and things have changed as a result of that. People, have, presidents who were standing up for their countries have now fallen in line much more. You know, based on what you're saying, John, um, I have to tell you, there was a time when I was really skeptical when I would hear people say, no war for oil. And I thought, oh, okay, that's just a bumper sticker slogan. But after reading your book and after hearing what you have to say, I'm not so sure that there's not some truth to that. So what was the expression, no war for no, oil? No war for oil. Or I guess we could say other natural resources as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and the wars in the Middle East certainly are to a certain degree about oil. But we also have to remember that wars or the mere threat of wars earn billions, trillions of dollars for the defense industries. Sure. And those are extensive. So, so 15% of the U.S. official U.S. budget goes to defense industries. But beyond that, there's another 20% or more that is totally supported by that through spinoffs. So, the, so all the companies that sell food or, or health care, uh, insurance, banking, all the submaterials to go into the, these war industries – they are all influenced by this whole war thing. So and they make their money off that. So it's a lot bigger than 15%, actually, if you come right down to all the spinoffs. So the fact of the matter is uh, wars, not only about oil and, and actually taking resources and destroying cities and then rebuilding them, which also makes a lot of money, they're also about uh, all the money that's made by uh, selling and buying and selling military equipment. So I'm curious, your book was published first, what, about 12 years ago? Yeah, to, the end of 2004 was when Confessions of an Economic Hitman was published. And the new Confessions, which up, updates that and has 15 new chapters, a whole new section about what we can do to change this. It's a very optimistic, but a whole strategy about how to change it. Uh, that came out just about a year ago. And, and that was one of the things I wanted to follow up with was, has the world changed since that first edition was printed? And if so, how? It's gotten worse, oh. and that's one, one of the reasons I wrote the second book that came out a year ago, and I'm working on another one now uh, that goes deeper, because really, it, the time I describe of, of economic hitmen, uh, we, we were really hitting what we call third world countries uh, in Africa and Latin America and parts of Asia and the Middle East. But in, the, in recent years, we've all been hit in the United States, in Europe. Uh, it, so the, the very techniques that we use in other countries are now being used in this country, the United States, and, and throughout the rest of the world. Uh, and it's being used against individuals. So this, this business of debt and fear. So, for example, today, uh, I, I talk to a lot of young people getting out of college who, who they'll say things like, I went to business school or law school because I really want to do the right thing. I want to create a better world so I can have children to live in. But I've got $200,000 worth of debt education debt. So I'm going to have to go to work for big corporations for five years till they pay it off. And then I can do what I want to do. But I know that the chances are once they're in there for five years, they'll fall in love, they'll get married, they'll buy a house, they'll have children, they'll take on more and more debt. They'll never get out of the system. And we find the same thing to be true in the healthcare system, that kind of debt, credit card debt. So debt enslaves people. And it's become much more prevalent around the world, but in the United States especially, in recent times. And we're also seeing the equivalent of economic hitmen in, in lobbyists who do incredible jobs at pitting states against each other to get an industry into their state. So Boeing has lobbyists that try to convince the state of Washington, where I live, that Boeing's going to, Boeing is going to move to someplace else, some other state, unless we lower its taxes. Or they'll go to other countries, and they pick countries against each other based on taxes, on unemployment standards and rates and so on and so forth. So when I was an economic hitman, we were a fairly small group of people, primarily generic. We wanted to bring money back to the United States so that our companies get paid to take, do these jobs. Those people still exist. But today, every major corporation has its equivalent of economic hitmen that are pushing for that corporation 
A lot of them are lobbyists. A lot of them are ex-senators or people from the House of Representatives who, who go out of, out of government and become uh, hired guns for big industry. So at some point, it sounds like you came to a realization that uh, you would not continue on as an economic hitman. Tell us about your transformation. Well, so when I went into this business, I thought it was the right thing because business school teaches you and the World Bank shows and statistics show that if you invest in these infrastructure projects, the economy of a country statistically improves. But as I got into this, after several years, I began to see that the statistics were totally skewed toward the very rich and the poor were getting poorer, relatively speaking. And of course, we know today, you know, eight individuals have as much wealth as half the world's population and half the world is on the verge of starvation or actually starving. And I began to see this and partly because I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer, I spoke Spanish fluently and go to Latin America and I could talk to people on the street. I could see how this was happening. But I have to say, Brian, that once I saw this, I was I was trapped. And this is part of the system, too. I was making a lot of money. I'd been gro- I'd grown up the fairly poor son of a teacher in New Hampshire. I'd always wanted to travel the world and stay in the best hotels and fly in first class and eat in the best restaurants, and now I was doing it. So I really didn't want to see the truth. But then uh, after 10 years in this job as an economic hitman, I took a vacation, and I was in the Virgin Islands. I'd rented a sailboat. And I, I rode the boat, the, the dinghy ashore late one afternoon, and climbed up this hill to the ruins of an old sugarcane plantation. It was beautiful up there, Bougainvillea, looking out over the sun setting on the Caribbean. And then suddenly it struck me that this plantation had been built on the bones of thousands of slaves. And then I realized the whole hemisphere is built on the bones of millions of slaves, Indians, indigenous people, and slaves from Africa. And then I had to admit that I, too, was a slaver. I wasn't putting people in physical chains. I was putting them in chains of debt and fear. And at that moment, I made the decision I, I wouldn't do it anymore. And I went back to my headquarters and went to my president's office and quit. That took a lot of courage, I imagine. It did. And, you know, I found myself without a job. <laughs> but it also was very cathartic. It was a huge relief. When I did it, they tried very hard at my company to get me to stay. They offered me all kinds of perks. I was very, you know, tempting. But on the other hand, I had such a tremendous feeling of relief once I quit that I, I quit. Well, John, we're going to talk in just a moment. I want to. I want you to tell us a little bit about some of the things that you are doing today that uh, I, I think are, are taking things in a very positive direction. Before we go there, though. Um, Let's talk about what, what our listeners, what individuals can do as they become aware of this. Most of this takes place out of their sight, and therefore it's, it's off their radar screens. What do you wish more people understood about these things that are going on? Well, first of all, I think it's really important for all, each, of, each of your listeners to understand that they have power. You know, these corporations run the world, but they're not sinister. They're just corporations. They're just people. And they're driven today by a, 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 a goal that really emerged in 1976 when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics. And his most significant statement was the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. That took us down this road in a big way to, an, to a system that's really failing us today. It's, it's given us amazing art and technology and medicine, et cetera, but it's gone too far. And Yet all these corporations are dependent on you and me and your listeners uh, to buy from them, to work for them, to manage them, to invest in them, to buy their stock, and so on and so forth. And so we need to recognize that we really have the power. And Brian, I can't begin to tell you, I speak at a lot of business conferences. I just came back from major international economic conferences in Russia, in Kazakhstan, where I spoke to, in in Russia, there were uh, uh, about 14,000 people. Uh, there and in Kazakhstan, four thousand. These were businessmen. These were leaders from all over the world. Prime, Putin was there. The Secretary General of the United Nations was there. There were many, many world leaders there. And what I'm, you know, finding as I talk to business executives at these conferences, CEOs, is they'll some of the, a lot of them will tell me, "Hey, I want to do the right thing. I've got children and grandchildren. We're headed we're headed toward disaster." 
I want to pay my workers in Indonesia a fair salary. I want to clean up pollution. But I know that if I lose half a percentage of market share, my, my primary stockholders will fire me and replace me with someone who only cares about market share. So they say, tell your readers, tell your listeners, send me an email. Send an email. So if every one of your readers picks a company, Monsanto, that seems to be enemy number one these days, uh, Chevron, uh, Nike, Walmart, I don't care, pick a company, send them an email, say something like, I love your products. That might be a little tough with Monsanto, but you can, you can phrase it right. <laughs> right. Be positive. I love your product, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia or wherever a fair salary, clean up the pollution you've caused, don't create any more pollution. I'm not going to buy anymore until you do the right thing, until you turn the death economy into a life economy that's based on regenerating destroyed environments, uh, cleaning up pollution and new technologies that don't ravage the earth anymore, that recycle, that use the sun and so on. And, and, and if every one of your listeners sends that email couple, every couple of weeks to that company and sends it out to all your social networking circles and asks them to send it, to that company and ask them to send it to all their social networking circles. And this is what CEOs tell me they want to get because they can then take these hundreds of thousands of emails to their primary stockholders, to their executive committees and say, hey, these are our customers. If we don't listen, we're going to go the way of Radio Shack and Sharper Image and Eastern Airlines and so on and so forth, companies that have, did not listen to their customers and or had made huge management mistakes. These executives get it. But they, despite the fact that they're very, very powerful in their own realms, they are also very vulnerable uh, to their primary stockholders. So in addition to contacting these corporations, are there things that we can do in our individual lives? You had mentioned, of course, debt. You mentioned, you know, the fear. And, and I think you even mentioned consumerism. Um, are there some steps that we can take as individuals that can kind of blunt these effects, you know, in our own personal lives. Brian, in the New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, I, I certainly recommend people buy that. Don't don't buy don't bother with the old confessions because most of the good materials in the new one plus a lot more. There's a long list of things everybody can do. And it, it divides down into what students can do, what parents can do, what executives can do, what teachers there's there's long lists. So there's a lot in there. But in summary of course, we all know about consumption. We all know we should we should cut back. We should be very conscious of what we consume and so on and so forth. But I think equally important is sending those emails. So, you know, I decided not to buy your tennis shoes, Nike, because you don't pay your workers a fair salary, but I'd love to buy them when you do pay your workers a fair salary, that kind of thing. But also, I think always looking for the story behind the story. My life is very... As a symbolic of the fact that there's always a story behind the story. We talked earlier about how people don't understand what's going on in these other countries. Look for that story. Don't accept what our leaders tell us on face value. Go deep. Look for the story. Publicize it. Send it out. Get your friends to look for the story. Question. Criticize. Democracy is built on criticism. It's built on really looking at our leaders and forcing them to do the right thing. And people sometimes say, oh, it's not patriotic to be so critical of your government. Well, I think that's the, that, that's the epitome of, criticism, of, of patriotism. We must constantly question what our leaders do and make them question themselves and look for better ways. So, so, so criticizing, looking for the story behind the story, uh, letting corporations know uh, shopping correctly, but also letting corporations know. These are some of the most standard things to do. But beyond that, there's a lot of other things you can do. And as, as I said, lots of lists in the new Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Okay, John, I want you to uh, tell our listeners where they can go if they want to follow up online. Um, you have a website you could direct them to? Absolutely, johnperkins.org. And I'd strongly recommend that they sign up for my newsletter, which comes out once a month. I think they're very interesting, or <laughs> I wouldn't write them, but they actually have to put their email in the little box there. I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook, and I do a lot of workshops, and a lot of give a lot of speeches all over the country, all over the world, and uh, they can see where I'm going to be speaking next uh, on that website, and I'd love to meet some of your listeners in person. Okay, and we're going to steer them towards New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which uh, was just released, and John Perkins, thank you so much for spending some time to tell your story 
and, and help our listeners see the light. My pleasure, Brian, and thank you so much for having a program like this and, and exposing people to these thoughts and ideas. I think that's so very, very important. I deeply appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. So maybe we learned a few things that we didn't know about uh, how the world operates. Now, you can, of course, subscribe to our podcast. We hope that you will. And, of course, we'll have links to uh, the websites that John has mentioned on this podcast, societyinthestate.com slash 10. We've got more exciting guests. We've got some more great discussion headed your way, and we hope you'll join us next time. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 